proclaim your good news. God, I pray right now with sincerity in my heart and just an emptiness of myself to have you to fill me with your spirit. Touch everybody that's listening, uh, that they're watching right now, that you may move upon their heart to accomplish all that you called them to accomplish for your name's sake. God, we profess to know nothing other than what you give us. And right now, I just ask you, give me your words. Help me to minimize that you might maximize um, in this day as we give you glory and honor. We ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody again uh, for joining here. Uh, we've been playing around uh, with the sound and with the video. And so I just want to send a special shout out and thank you to Sister uh, Andrea Bivens. She is a phenom when it comes to the technical stuff. And so um, I told Sister Bivens that uh, she's a bit of a pair of crutches for me. You know, if I know that she's near, then my confidence is, is good in the technology. And so I just want to thank her for um, just really all that she's done and put into making this uh, live stream a reality. And so this is the beginning of what, what, what God is doing uh, for us. And so um, I just ask uh, everybody to uh, button up, put your seatbelt on, because where God is taking us, um, again, we want to make sure that we don't lose anybody in the process. Um, as we think about this day, uh, last week we had talked about this idea of how do we live. Uh, we had just gone past and completed the observance of Resurrection Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the, the challenge of the question that I asked last week is, what's different about our lives? Uh, what should be different as a result of Christ uh, being not just out of the grave, but ascending to sit on the right hand of the Father? Um, I've been in church all my life, and I, and I can't say that necessarily uh, I, I lived all of my life for Christ. But when I committed, when I decided to engage, I had to give up some things. And so my life became different. There were different ways that I thought. There were things that I gave up. There were friendships and relationships that I let go of uh, because my life was changed. I was living for someone else. Um, and so we asked that question last week. The thing that I want to do is to continue along those lines and really talking about how we are to live as believers, how we are to live um, in light of sinners and non-believers in the midst of this world. The Bible tells us that, you know, we're going to encounter challenges and troubles and tribulations, but Jesus Christ himself says, be of good cheer. Don't trip off of that. I've already overcome that. I'm already sitting at the finish line. And so the question is not whether God has a plan or whether or not he's going to meet the needs or the challenges that we face today. It's whether you and I finish and how we finish. And so I want to deal today with uh, dealing with sort of the hidden dangers or things that we uh, tend to not, not, not necessarily sever or get rid of. They're, they're, they're the things that kind of go under the surface. I remember my freshman year in high school, and, and you all forgive me, I got my, my glasses on. These are those transition lenses. They're going to be kind of dark for a moment until I take them off after I read the scripture and then and we'll move forward in that one. But I remember my freshman year, uh, you know, hearing my parents talk about that, you know, we were on the brink of war. And what they were re referring to was the, the altercation that was taking place in Argentina between the British and the Argentinians in South America. And uh, for those of that, are, that, that remember, it was the Falkland crisis and we were on the brink of war. And one of the things that came out of that story was the fact that the Navy's army was one of the best in the world. But their premier attack uh, destroyer was sank with one missile that came from an Argentinian fighter plane. And so there was a lot of, you know, uh, 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 bustling and hustle about what, what, what led to that. You know, are, are these tankers, these state-of-the-art tankers obsolete? Are these destroyers something of the past time? And once they begin to dig in to find out what happened, how is it that one missile sank this incredible state-of-the-art destroyer? they realized that they began to do the forensics of the computer programming and they realized that the, the, the ship was programmed not to see the incoming missile as a threat. You see, it was a French missile that the Argentinians fired on this vessel. And so in all of the threats that were built into the surveillance system and the anti-aircraft uh, systems, they missed this one particular missile. You see, what was a threat was not perceived as a threat. And, and so I want to start there because there are things that, that you and I, we contend with on a regular basis and we, we, we sort of put up with or we may, may live in the midst of some things that are dangerous, they're detrimental to our health. 
Uh, some folks, you know, stay on jobs for long past the shelf life, long past the time where, where God is telling you to let go. And so we stay on those for different reasons and, and, and not all bad. You know, we do it to, you know, take care of the children. We do it to pay bills or to make sure that we're good stewards and pay off the debt that we may have accumulated. But in the process, sometimes we, we, we have to think about and come to the question of, is this God's will for our lives? I know many people, I've, I've talked to family members and friends and I've counseled them about relationships that they knew it was bad, they knew it wasn't the thing that God had called them to do, but the, 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 the conversation was, I put too much time and energy in this relationship to let it go. You see, sometimes we, we, we look at the investment of the time and the emotions as a determination of what we do or whether we move away from something. And, and let me tell you this, you know, it, 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 whatever time that you put into something, you're not going to get that back. And so we can't use that as a determination of what God's will is. Sometimes we, we don't, you know, we're not just in jobs or relationships, but sometimes there are things that we're dealing with in our lives and we just kind of put up with it. We're able to function. We're able to go to work. We're able to do all the things that, you know, our lives require us to do. But, but below the surface, there's unrest. Below the surface, there's agitation. Some of us have may, may have physical disorders as a result of those things. And, and so when we, we, we think about that, if you talk to some of the folks that have been living for a while, they'll tell you that you'll always see red flags. Red flags are always going to show up. There's no such thing as a surprise that, oh my gosh, I didn't believe that he and she could, he or she could be like that. Or, man, I didn't know that job was causing so much harm in my family and taking time away from the family. Old folks will say it like this, the red flags were there. You and I just chose to go past them. And sometimes we go past them, not for any uh, evil reasons, but we go past sometimes because of the desires and things that we have inside of us. And, and so when we, when we look at that, you know, we, we got to ask ourselves, what's really going on? The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs uh, 14 and 25, the Bible says that, you know, the, the, the thing is that, you know, uh, Proverbs in 16, I'm sorry, Proverbs 16 uh, is that all the ways are good in a man, to a man in his own eyes. But we must com submit our intent to the Lord, who, who, our, our, our hearts to the Lord who weighs the intent. Sometimes we approach things out of, you know, a feeling of, you know what, this is the best thing for me. This is the best thing that God is calling me to. But the Bible says for us to submit our heart. Let us put that before the Lord who weighs the intent. And so I, I can recall making many decisions in my life. And um, the older I get and the the, the, the more I kind of be around this Bible thing, the more I you know, spend time with the Lord, the more seemingly like hesitant I become in making decisions. Not that my confidence fails, not that I don't feel competent to be able to make decisions, but I realize, as, as Paul says in, in Romans 7 and 21, is that even when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. Evil is present with me. That's, that's, that's something that, that causes a bit of, okay, God, I see it, but I want to make sure that it's not George and that it's you that's called. And so when we think about this idea of, of, of you know, dangers that go under the surface, the danger is not something that's on the outside. It's actually something that's on the inside of us. And so we must do as the, the scriptures say, let us commit our hearts to the Lord who weighs the intent. The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 14 and 25 is that there's a way that seems right to us. There's a way that, that makes sense and it passes the sniff test and passes all the logic. But the end of that road, that pathway, that decision is death. And so how, how do we get out of this, this sort of uh, 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 you, you know, duplicity inside of us? How do we balance ourselves? Well, well, the good news is that you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you've had to, you were uncertain about which way to go or what decision you needed to make and maybe you were looking for a sign, God knew that we would pass this way. He knew that we would come past uh, these decisions, the decision matrix. And, and so when we look at the scriptures, and this is where I want to read, and I promise I'm going to take my, my shades off here. Uh, we're going to be coming from the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. We're still in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 1 and 20. And it says this, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. 
So, so, so in other words, in all the wisdom and knowledge of God, 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 God is, is, is talked about in every university in the world. But, but even despite talking about God, people didn't still come to the wisdom that they are in need of a savior. And so Paul asked the question, and even in the wisdom of things, you know, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. So God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation, the preaching, to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and obeying of his most holy word. And so when we look at Paul's writings here, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, again, Corinthian, this letter written to the church at Corinth, Corinth, the area, the, the, the cities that encompass that area, it was a cultural and commercial mecca. If you wanted to, to, to get the best of anything, Corinth was the place to, to be. It's almost like our modern day L.A. or New York. That is the place where you would go. And, and, and so not only was it a, a cultural and commercial Mecca, but it was also a place where there were many religions that were, were practiced in that place. And the church that God had placed there was in the minority numerically. Keep in mind, when we have God on our side, we're in the majority, but sometimes we lose sight of the, the, the fact that God is all powerful because we're looking at the numbers. And so the church began to be influenced by the culture around it. They began to, 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 to debate about things. And when you read the books of First and Second Corinthians, you read about some really silly debates that they were having. You know, who baptized you? Why, well, Paul baptized me and Apollos baptized you. Then, then there's something must be wrong with you because you see, I was baptized by this person here. We have those same sort of, uh, go through the same sort of intellectual jumping jacks. And, and, and sometimes you just got to wonder, what, what does Christ look at? Is, is God really satisfied and pleased with us when we go through those, those sort of intellectual debates? And so the church was going through these gyrations and they were experiencing things. And Paul is writing a letter to let them know that ought not to be. He says that the Jews, that they look for a sign. You see, they were looking for a sign. By the time that we read 1 Corinthians, it had been some 20 years since the ascension of Christ. And so the Jews were looking for a sign all throughout history of this Messiah that would come. But you see, when Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem, we, we, we saw it in that, that, that sort of passion week. He comes in on a, on, on a donkey. He comes in on a, on a mule and not a white horse. And, and the fact that he didn't look like a king, but he had all of the things of the king that we know him to be. But you see, the Jews were waiting. He was not the Messiah because the prophecy was that that Messiah would come back and restore Israel to its rightful place. When you see the first chapter of Acts and they ask before Jesus ascends into heaven, hey, 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 wh wh when are we going to be restored back? You see, the Jews were looking for a sign. The Bible says that the Greeks, they look for wisdom. We, we think about Aristotle and Plato and the great philosophers of our days. The Greeks were, were known for their intellectual firepower. And so Paul is saying that the, the, the Greeks rely on the wisdom and the Jews look for signs. But you see, God, knowing that's the case, God, God, God was not worshipped even in the presence of all that wisdom, even in the presence of the signs that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He said that God used the foolishness of preaching. He, he took those things that are despised and left out, the marginalized, and he raises them up. And so by the foolishness of the preaching, God's message and his power is, is, is emanating through. And so when Paul's writing this letter, he's saying that there are some things that, 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 that are going below the surface that you need to recognize in order that you might accept Jesus Christ on his terms, in order that you might not discount others because of how they look on the outside, because you see, Jesus uses the foolish things, uses the foolish things to confound the wise. You see, I'm, I'm doing this stream here, and, and, and I'm in the parking lot of Nordstrom's. I don't know if you guys can see that behind me. Nordstrom's last year did uh, five, 15 billion dollars in revenue. That particular store right behind us does about a million five per week. But, but here, here's the thing. How much do you think that they did in the last 30 days in sales volume? Uh, I hope this doesn't come out as a spoiler alert, but 
but they did absolutely nothing. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't collect a dime. You see, like everything else around us, they're under the shelter in place alert as well. And so the, the stores closed, not because of something that came in the door, but because of the potential threat that would bring harm to their primary business. In that same fashion, the Apostle Paul, he, he's writing this letter to Corinth and saying that even though you're in the church, even though you're in the presence of God, even though you're, you're, you're there and God is using you, recognize there are some things that I'm seeing and hearing about that, that have nothing to do with the power of God, but it's running under the surface and, and you need to make a life decision. Paul says that you need to become imitators of me as I am an imitation of Christ. And, and so what happens is that that they were acting out not like saved folk, but they were acting just like everyday folk. It's kind of like the, some of the folks that 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 have the big cross on their on, on their necks, and you know, got big giant Bibles and high definition, and got big color maps and all kinds of things. We have the outward workings of belief, but our inward behaviors, the things that we think about people, don't marry. They don't imitate Christ. And so Paul is, is, is just like the Nordstrom's closed because of a potential threat, because of a real danger. Paul was encouraging the church that you need to make a change. You need to, to make some changes in your life. Be bold and courageous. Don't be fearful. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And, and, and knowing that he, he said that, you know, we will overcome these things. He said that, that, that you're going to go through some stuff, but I've already overcome. I'm already at the finish line. You and I are called to make decisions. Here's a question that I have for you that, that are watching, that are listening. What are the things that are preventing you from making the necessary changes that you know you need to make? It's kind of like, I go, again, go back to the old folks. Talk to somebody that's been around for a while. They'll tell you, yeah, there's, there's signs and there are red flags that have been there the whole time. But what is it that prevents us from, from seeing those red flags as real danger and not necessarily potential danger? I submit to you that sometimes we, because we're able to function in the presence of sin, it takes away the sense of urgency to, to, to sever our relationship with sin. That's how we end up in relationships that, that are detrimental to our health, detrimental to our well-being. That's how we end up in jobs or making money in ways that God is not pleased with. We end up putting ourselves in a bind because of things that are in us and not realizing the danger, the long-term danger of the things that are in us, that sin. The, the Bible says that the wages of that sin, the sin that every man is born into, the wages of sins, Romans 6 and 23, is death. Ultimately, not just a physical death, we're all going to die, but spiritual death, that, that you would be in the absence of God forever. How, how long is forever? Forever is forever. It just goes on and on and on. But what are the things that prevent you from making the necessary changes? Some folks that are watching and that are listening right now, you, you, you've made decisions and choices by how you felt or by, by, by what seemed to be pleasing by family members and those around you. But is that the right way to make a decision? A decision that God says that I'm calling you to be accountable for your own life? You see, sometimes we end up staying in a thing too long. We end up burning ourselves out and we look at that invested time as reason why we cannot let it go because I put too much time in it. I, I remember when I was a little kid, I used to have those little toy planes and like many of you all are, I had my army men, the little green plastic army men, which I wish I had kept them. They would probably be worth a lot of money right now. But I used to have these little planes that I would get you know, from the store and every time I go to the store, probably like many of you that are watching, I had to get something because that was to let me know that I had been at the store. And I remember getting a little bitty Red Baron plane, the little bi-wing plane. If, if, if you know, for those history buffs that are listening or watching today, Red Baron, he, he was one of the most successful pilots of all time. Uh, he had, I think he scored 80 kills before his plane was eventually shot down. And the only reason he was shot down is because he continued to pursue an enemy plane too long and too deep into enemy territory. He couldn't let it go. And so what he did is he ended up flying into enemy territory and there were anti-aircraft guns from the ground that basically took him out. He stayed in the fight too long. Had he pulled out before he chased that enemy aircraft into their sweet spot, into their home territory, he might have survived. Like the Red Baron, most of us, we stay in things too long. And I'm not 
uh, giving any prescription for specifics in your life, but, but we must measure ourselves by what the word says. But again, Paul is saying that, that people use wisdom, they use signs, but, but, but it's the proclamation of the word. God has used the foolishness of what we're talking about today to save souls, to change lives. That you and I would read something and we might understand a truth about who we are and who God is that might transform us from the inside out. Not just putting on a new behavior, but actually feeling it down on the inside. But you see, the thing I ask you again is, what is it that's holding you back? What is it that's preventing you from making the decisions that you know that you need to make? You know you need to make a change. You know that you need to get to a place to get closer with God. Don't let friends and, and comfort be your deterrent. Don't let that be the thing that takes you into the enemy's camp and allows you to be totally destroyed, not just in this physical body, but spiritually to be forever without God. What would our lives be like? And let me just kind of talk about what would our lives be like if we follow God in everything that we could do, that, that you and I would be able to discern his, his will and his wisdom in every single decision. How much peace would we have? How, how many blood pressure medications could we probably just kind of throw in the trash because our, we don't have to worry anymore because we know that we are in the sweet spot of God's will? Again, I come back to the question that I asked at the very beginning of this that we talked about last week. How are you and I supposed to live? That ultimately is the question. What is God's plan for our lives? Hattie Green, this is the last thing that I'll share with you, and it's just interesting when, you know, as an adult now, I look back and see all kinds of wisdom. But, but again, when you're going through it and you're a young person, you think you're invincible and you make all kinds of dumb decisions. But Hattie Green was a, a woman that was considered the richest woman in America. She lived back in the early 1900s. And Hattie Green, when she died, I think it was around 1916, her net worth, her, her value was about $100 million, which if you, if you think about in today's terms, she was up there with the Bill Gates and the, 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 the Steve Jobs of the world. She was rich. But when you look at her life, she lived in poverty. She, she, she struggled to, to keep the heat on. She always kept the house cold because she was worried about giving the power companies money for bills. When her son got sick, she waited so long to take him to the doctor because she didn't want to pay for the care of her son. And she waited so long that by the time she did get him to the doctor, they had to amputate his leg. When she died in 1916, she was still haggling and had issues about the, 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 the power and the prevalence of skim milk in the culture. She, she felt like, you know what, this skim milk, this is the good stuff. And she was arguing with folks when she died about skim milk worth $100 million. Here's the thing that I leave with you. She had all the resources to, to, to impact her life in a very different way. If you look at her life, her life was not reflective of the ability that she had. And, and, and so in that same fashion, the question that I ask you that are watching today is, does your life reflect a life with the Lord of the universe on our side? Does your life encompass you know, uh, not just something that looks powerful on the inside, but there's, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding that's on the inside that, that drives you to make decisions, not for the popularity, not for, for, for being seen in a certain light, but to reflect his glory because the joy on the inside can't be contained in our bodies, can't be contained in your heart. And, and so I encourage all of you all that are listening to, to think about the words of the Apostle Paul, that the Lord in these final days, he's used the, the foolishness of preaching. He's used the proclamation of a word that was written over 2,000 years ago, uh, written in a, in a language and a culture that's far from where we're standing today. But yet, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will, will, will inter, be an intercessory for our prayers that he'll bring back to our remembrance the things that we read and, and give us understanding that we cannot understand in our natural might and strength. We have the Lord on our side and the question is, is your life, will your life, does your life reflect that he's on your side? Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to be able to share the good news. I pray that, that if there is someone that is listening today that does not know Jesus, that does not, has not made a profession of faith to declare Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that you touch their heart in this moment, in this opportunity. 
Lord, if I've, if I've made a mistake, if I've talked too fast, if I've said some things that are incoherent, Lord, I just pray that you, you step into the middle of that and to straighten it up, touch the ears and the hearts of those that are listening and watching, that they may understand the appointed time in life that you've called them to. Lord, I just pray and ask you right now, if I've committed any sin against you, if I've, 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 I've done things that are not pleasing in your sight, I'm asking for forgiveness and I ask for your grace and your mercy to cover not only myself, but all of us. If we've done anything to err, God, we just ask for mercy and your forgiveness as we proclaim and profess to, to be your disciples. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We pray for those that are sick and shut in, those that are not able to get out of the house, those that might be sick with the virus right now. God, I just pray that your, your, your healing and your power and authority, that it might reach them, that they may recover if it be your will, that they can give a testimony to all that are around them and all that will meet them about your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen, amen, amen. Again, I want to thank you all again. Uh, this is a big step. Um, launching out because I can't see people. I'm talking to the camera, talking to the video, and I, I, I just I just miss the sort of the feedback, if you will. But I believe God has called us to a place that where this is necessary. It's necessary not because of the shelter in place, but because we're commissioned to go out into all the world and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I, I just want to encourage you to uh, find some time this week. Um, I know we're on Sunday, but find some time this upcoming week to encourage at least five people. It may be family members, might be friends. It might be the folks that are in the house that you're sheltered in place with. Try to take a pause and pump the brakes to see how you can be an encouragement to them. You may have had a strained relationship for years, but that doesn't mean that the rest of today or the rest of next week has to be the same as it used to be. If you've been encouraged by this message, uh, we're going to find a means to be able to allow you to share this. And if there's somebody that, as you were listening, as you were watching, that you think, man, so-and-so needed to hear this, we're going to make this available for you to be able to share with them. Because again, we want to go out and to free as many people as possible from the bonds and the, 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 the things of this flesh that constrain us and keep us down, keep us depressed, to think that this is all that God has for us. God has called for us as sojourners in this world. We're, we're passing through, but we are to live free from the power of sin. And so if you believe that there's somebody that needs to hear that word, we'll make sure that you're able to pass this message along. For those of you that are inclined to be able to support our ministry, Church of the Living God, um, in Pittsburgh, California. I know some people may be watching this in other states, um, but in Pittsburgh, California, um, you can text giving in. Because I cannot uh, actually put the link on the screen quite yet, but that's coming, uh, where you could actually go on your computer to send that. Uh, for this broadcast, for this telecast, we're going to do text giving. Uh, the number to put in the number uh, that you're sending the text to is 73256. Again, 73256. And in the message area where you put your message in, uh, put in C as in cat, O as in Oscar, uh, T as in Tom, L as in Larry, G as in God, 21. C-O-T-L-G 21, and then hit the send button. You're gonna get a message back saying you're almost there. Click this link to complete your giving. And we ask if, if you've been blessed, if, if, if you wanna be a blessing to this ministry, uh, continue to seed in us. We are looking for you to make a regular uh, commitment. Um, in the system, you can put a reoccurring payment or support if you like, if you think that that's what you want to do. But we believe that if we are obedient to the Lord, if we get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the world, we encourage the, the, the folks that don't know Christ to, to come and give him a starting place in their lives. If you believe that, that, that God is calling you to be able to support us, please consider being a regular giver. Um, again, the text number is 73256. The message is C-O-T-L-G-21.